<clears throat> All right, we're going live and uh, just waiting for some folks to come on. Amen. Praise God. Nice brisk day out today. Uh, winter is here, and uh, but it was actually a very nice day. So I see uh, some folks starting to come on, and um, great. Hi, Sister Gloria. Nice to see you tonight. Praise God. And um, just uh, give me a thumbs up on the sound and the picture, uh, if, if you guys can hear me okay. Amen. Praise God, Sister Kim. Sister Jessica, good evening. Nice to see you. Praise God. Nice to see you in church this morning. Hallelujah. Hi, Kathy Brisson, Brother Andy. Nice to see you. All good. Thank you, Sister Gloria. Thank you, Brother Andy. I got my sound crew out there. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Well, it was just a nice, uh, sunny, brisk day today. Uh, thank you, Sister Kim. I'm glad that uh, you guys can hear me okay. I always like to check and make sure before we start. That everything's A-OK. -okay. Amen. Praise the Lord, Sister Donna. Nice to see you. Yeah, when we got out of church this morning, it felt so nice out uh, that I was almost tempted to go fishing. But then someone said, you better bring your long underwear. <laughs> Amen. Hello, Sister Yolanda. Nice to see you. Hey, Brother Greg. God bless you and your family. Uh, good to see you. Sister Judy, how you doing? Amen. Praise God. I hope you're feeling better. Amen. Tonight, praise God. And uh, nice to see you coming on, you folks at home. Praise God. Yeah. Harris family watching. Good. Good. Praise God. Oh, uh, well, we'll keep your brother in prayer, Brother Andy. Uh, the folks are seeing that on the post. So at the end of uh, this broadcast, we'll Pray for your brother and, and rest of the family members who may be experiencing the same thing. And uh, so we'll believe God that uh, they'll make it through. Amen. We live in a day when uh, prayers uh, is essential. Pastor preached on that this morning, an excellent message on prayer. And, um, so, and, and also uh, working for the Lord while the time is here. Um, I'm going to talk tonight a little bit, uh, not on the same lines, but I'm going to talk about the comforter that God gave us to help us do the work of God. Amen. Hi, Sister Dorothea. Praise God. Nice to see you on tonight. I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes for people to come on. Amen. Praise God. So, um, uh, maybe we could sing a little chorus while we're waiting for some folks to come on. Uh, I was thinking, I, I, I like simple choruses. Uh, I think everybody knows this one. So if you know it, just sing right along with us, okay? It's called, uh, I'm going to thank him in, through the day and in, in the morning. All right, so let's sing that together. I'm going to thank him in the morning. I'm going to thank him through the day. I'm going to thank him in the evening when the blue skies turn to gray. I'm going to thank him every moment for all around me I see the many, many wonderful blessings that God has bestowed upon me. I'm going to thank him in the morning. I'm going to thank him through the day. I'm going to thank him in the evening when the blue skies turn to gray. I want to thank him every moment for all around me I see. The many, many wonderful blessings that God has bestowed upon me. Amen. Praise God. And uh, we can all attest to that, 
to the many wonderful blessings that God has given us. And uh, when you look around um, and see what you do have, you have a lot compared to so many people in the world that don't have what you have. Uh, many foreign countries uh, experiencing, you know, food shortages and and some some children only are fortunate even if they get one meal a day. And so we're very blessed here in America. And I know we've had some things happen uh, out west and down south with the tornadoes. Please keep those folks in your prayers. Uh, the devastation was pretty vast. And I know that our church is going to be trying to help those areas. So stay tuned and how you can help. Uh, hi, Mama. Nice to see my Mama on tonight. God bless you. Love you, Mother. And uh, God gave me the greatest mother in the world. And uh, she truly is a mother in Zion and a mother of the Bible. The virtuous woman is definitely my mother. My grandmother was the same way. My mom's mom. Very, very beautiful, virtuous woman. And uh, just so blessed uh, to have them in our family and uh, all our family. And I, I hope that your family is doing well. And at the end of this broadcast, we'll pray for all our families. Amen. That they'll be saved and find the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to get started. Uh, looks like uh, uh, pretty much everybody's on that's coming on. There might be a couple more pop in. But uh, tonight, um, if uh, you could um, uh, open your Bible, you could kind of follow along a little bit tonight because uh, we're going to stay in one portion of Scripture so you won't have to flip your Bible so much, uh, you know, back and forth. Hi, Sister Donna, and thank you, Sister Kim, uh, for, and for helping us sing too, and nice to see you all here. So if you do have your Bible, would you turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 16, and verses 7 through 15 uh, is what we're going to be talking about. And uh, it's a great portion of Scripture. Uh, most of us have probably read this a few times or at least know about it. And I just wanted to cover this tonight. I was been thinking about this for a little while, and uh, I'm not going to be too in-depth, but just to touch on some of these points of what we have and, and, and really what the work of the Holy Spirit is. You know, I know that the Holy Spirit fills us with peace, love, and joy, and that's wonderful. I know that the Holy Spirit gives us power to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit through us is also has a mission. And I want to talk a little bit about the mission of the Holy Spirit. And But, but the Holy Spirit needs us to fulfill that mission. So it's so vital. We're like a team. So... That's what I want to talk about tonight. Amen. So John, the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 7 through 15. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he tells them this. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart... I will send him, the Comforter, unto you. And when he is come, and the Comforter is the Holy Spirit, okay? So when the Holy Spirit is come, he's going to do three things, okay? Number one, he's going to reprove the world of sin. He's going to reprove the world of sin, and he's also going to reprove the world of righteousness, of righteousness. And also he's going to reprove the world of judgment. Uh, this is very interesting to me, this portion of scripture, when I first read it, because I just wanted to understand really what this means. So then let's have a word of prayer before we go on and ask God to give us uh, wisdom and understanding. Amen. Lord, we just thank you today for your gospel. We thank you for your words that are here in, your, in the Bible that you go, told John, and John wrote them down for us to see and to hear. Lord, help us to understand the mission of the Holy Spirit in us and how we're a part of that mission to win the lost. So help us tonight, Lord. Bless each and every one. 
If someone is sick that's listening to my voice tonight, I pray that you touch them right now. Remove that sickness so they can hear your word, Lord, and they can get it into their heart and let them enjoy the service here tonight. I just thank you for that. In your mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for praying. So he came to do three things, to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, Jesus goes on to explain this in the next passage, starting at verse 9. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. In verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Hello, Brother Gabriel. Nice to see you, my friend, and your whole family. God bless you. So he says in verse 12, uh, John 16, verse 12, How be it when uh, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you can't bear them now. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, is come he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, or receive of me, and shall show it unto you. So Jesus, through the Spirit, is going to communicate with you personally. Amen. He shall glorify me, and he shall receive of mine and show it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, said I, that he shall take of mine and show it to you. So it's the office that we're talking about. I want you to see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? The three uh, parts or offices or manifestations of God in order to fulfill a certain work. We have God the Father who is the creator God, who made the universe and the heavens and the earth. Then we have the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is still the essence of God, but in flesh, because he was sent to be our sacrifice for our sins. The flesh, not his spirit. His spirit did not die on the cross. His flesh died, experienced death. Then we have now the Holy Spirit, which is the very Spirit of God sent to us as a messenger, as a, a comforter to comfort us, even the Spirit of truth. Uh, this Spirit of truth is definitely one of the seven spirits of God before his throne. God cannot lie. Uh, he can only tell the truth. Amen? So the Spirit of truth is vital to your Christian walk. So um, let's take a look at that now. Let's break this down a little bit. So number one, he said, he will reprove the world of sin. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, he's going to use us, work with us, to reprove the world of sin. Now, I looked into what reprove meant. It's not what we think it means when we first read it. It isn't condemn, condemning the world. It's not preaching to the world to make them feel bad. The, the actual word reprove means convince. Convince or convict. Conviction and convincing are similar. So in other words, the Holy Spirit will convince the world of sin and what sin is. This is very important for people to be saved. Without that conviction, they will not know what sin is. They, they, a lot of people, when you talk to them, especially in America, when you mention the word sin, the first thing that comes to their mind is the Ten Commandments. And then also we talk about, you know, don't murder people, don't, don't steal. Don't, and yes, those are sins. That's right. But we never really spend much time on the essence of sin and what sin really is or the root of sin which is separation from God. So the Holy Spirit, through us 
and the using the word of God also will convince someone or convict someone that they are lost in sin and therefore hallelujah need a savior praise god isn't that wonderful conviction is not a bad thing conviction is not a bad thing conviction is not condemnation conviction has a, has a couple of meanings it means to be convicted yourself in other words, okay, you've changed my mind. You've convinced me that what I'm doing is not correct. That's conviction. But conviction also means the way I live. I live by my convictions. In other words, what I believe, you see? So let's put it in the proper perspective tonight. So when you reach out to souls, you are equipped to say, Lord, give me a word in due season to the lost. You know, a word in due season is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. My, my prayer when I meet someone and God opens a door for me to, to testify and share the salvation plan with them, my prayer is that I'll say something that will cause a, a conviction, not, not a condemnation, but a conviction to come, a convincing, that leaves that person saying, I need to be saved. I, I want Jesus. Jesus loves me. Jesus cares about me. You see what I'm getting at? We, 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 we got to stop presenting a gospel that, that is always down on people, looking down on them. Uh, it's Christmas time, folks, right? Do you remember what the angel said on the first Christmas morning? Huh? He said, glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah. On our, on, on earth. Peace and goodwill to all men. I bring to you great tidings of great joy. I mean, there is nothing bad about that report. There is nothing negative in that announcement. I give you great tidings of great joy, glad tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen. Everything about Christmas morning's announcement was the most beautiful, positive message the world had ever heard. Because now sin can be dealt with. You understand, sin now. The Holy Spirit came to convince people that they need Jesus. Oh, help me, Lord, to, to be open to that. Help me to be a vessel that can be used for God. He will, he will convince the world about the guilt of sin and the need of a Savior. He will also convince the world about the true nature of sin. And Jesus said, the reason is because they do not believe in my message. Do you remember when we read in the beginning? Because they believe not on me. You see, now, once you hear the gospel message about salvation, then what happens is sin now is magnified even greater because now a choice looms in my our hearts. Do you remember when you first heard the gospel and it clicked like something convinced you that you needed this? But maybe you didn't get saved right away, right? You kind of maybe fought it. I, I was one of those people that did not get saved the first time I heard the gospel. But the seed was planted and that seed began to grow. And people came and watered that seed for the next couple of years. And it grew into a place where I realized I realized I need Jesus. And then I understood that sin separated me from Jesus. Jesus isn't the bad guy. He's the good guy. He wants to save my soul. Amen. So this is what he, he, the Holy Spirit came to do. You see, sin separated man and killed man's relationship with God. But Jesus came to restore that relationship. The purpose of man's creation, we talked about that last week, was that he might fellowship with God. God wanted to create you. God wanted to make you. And he made you good. And he made you blessed. And he crowned you with glory and honor. But what happened? Sin came into our world through disobedience to God. It wasn't God's fault. It was man's fault. 
Adam and Eve failed. They disobeyed and brought sin. But God did not abandon them even though they failed. He couldn't let them live in sin and keep the sin. That's why he put an angel to guard the tree of life, lest they would eat of the tree of life and remain in their sins forever and forever separated from God. No, he stopped that. He had a new plan come into motion. A redeemer would come to save us from those sins and bring us back to God. Amen. That's the good news of the gospel. Share that with everybody this Christmas season. Tell them the good news, the glad tidings of great joy. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Amen. When you surrender your life to Christ, you will know why you were created. He promised that his spirit will witness to your spirit that you've passed from death unto life. That's why a man must be born again before he can see the kingdom of God. A man must be born of water and of the spirit before he can enter the kingdom of God. There's a process of rebirth, and that rebirth comes from the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That is the primary job of the Holy Spirit is to rekindle our our spiritual man and bring it back to life in the presence of God and give us life. Amen. That's great. God bless you, Sister Tracy. I see you there. Hallelujah. So so let's go on here. You see, Jesus said, the Spirit will reprove of sin because they believe not on me. And 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 what what that all that means is I've come now. I've brought the message. Hear the message. Believe me. Because if you don't believe me, what's going to happen is that sin is going to get a stronger hold on your life more than ever before. You see, the Bible talks about how the law came to show us what sin was. The law, until the law came, we did not know what sin was. We didn't understand it. But when the law came... It showed us, don't do this, don't do that. It it made it clear that these things were sins and these things were displeasing to God. But the law could not save us because it was weak through the flesh. But God, hallelujah, but God, sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he abolished sin on the cross. He forgave every sin ever committed, past, present, and future. Now we can be free from sin and be reunited with God again in full fellowship. Amen. Amen. So listen to this. Because if you have Jesus, he that hath the Son hath life. But if you don't have Jesus, you don't have real life. Oh yes, you're alive in the natural, but you don't have that spiritual life. That only can happen with the born-again experience with the Holy Spirit. Amen. All sins were covered by the death of Jesus Christ. The Bible says God laid on him the iniquities of us all. Oh my God, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see that? Jesus is everything to us. He's our wisdom. He's our righteousness. He's our peace. He's our truth. He's the bread of life. He's the water of life. He's everything. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. When talking to Nicodemus, Jesus said this, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, this is what the Holy Spirit will do. It will convince you You need Jesus. That's all. If you just call on Jesus, if you just ask him to help you, he will be there for you. Amen? So the Holy Spirit came to convince the world of sin through us. So this holiday season, take time and share with people the goodness of God and how he brought salvation to us. Number two, number two, the Holy Spirit will reprove the world of righteousness. He will reprove or convince the world of righteousness. About the righteousness that pleases God. Now, this is interesting because 
This responsibility Jesus kind of leaves with his disciples and with us. He goes, because he said, I'm going to my father and you will no longer see me. That means I'm not going to be there physically to hold your hand every day so that you do the right thing. You know, uh, you're going to have to learn how to do this because of your choice on your own. Let me, let me show you that again here. He, the Holy Spirit will convince the world of righteousness. It convinces us of what's right because it's the spirit of truth. Remember, he leads us and guides us into all truth. We need not err in the gospel when we have the Holy Spirit. He will lead us and guide us. So, But our responsibility is to keep the righteousness of Jesus in our life. That is the personal integrity and godly character of Christ, of a Christian. Amen. You see, you're not going to tell people you're a Christian and then you steal from them. You're not going to tell people you're a Christian and then you're going to get mad and swear at them. You're not going to tell people you're a Christian at work and then you come late every day or you hide in a corner and don't do your job. And You see, there's a responsibility being a Christian. When you tell the world you're a Christian, you have just said that I am going to live a righteous, godly life that Jesus gave to me. And I'm going to keep that personal integrity and godly character. So that means we must decide. We must decide to be godly and righteous in this present world. You know, men do possess varying standards of righteousness. There are many good people striving to live a righteous life. We talked a little bit about that last week, how multitudes are in the valley of decision. They're trying to find God a different way through good works or through just being good people. They think that might be enough. But our job with the gospel is to show them that as good as we can be ourselves, there's that curse of sin that must be dealt with. And let God take that away, and, and then we're going to do even more, even more good things uh, for Jesus Christ. So there's many good people striving to live a righteous life. There, there's many good people involved in our community and charitable projects. Um, there will be uh, hundreds of thousands of people that will rally and help those tornado victims. Uh, the, 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 when the earthquakes happened in Haiti, uh, all the needs of our world, there are people that respond out of the goodness of their heart and want to help them. I don't want to take that away from them. I can't tell them that that's not good. Of course it's good. We need that. But then we also, we also um, have to understand God's righteousness supersedes our own. You see, what happens is they, th that part of doing good can have a snare to it. Sometimes I've seen people pride themselves in being fair and honest. And, and, the, and these people are sometimes the hardest to reach with the gospel because they are doing good things. But the thing is, you have to understand that even though you do good things, you, even though you're successful, and I'm talking to pretty much Americans right now, we live in the, one of the richest countries in the world. We don't have many needs here, really. I mean, we still have some, but compared to other countries, we're doing fantastic. And sometimes we can get to a place where we don't really feel a need for God. Like, everything's going good. I, I've got a great job. I make a lot of money. i got a nice car. I've got a nice family. Those, those are all great blessings. But your need for God goes beyond the just the balance of natural life. It goes into eternal life. You have to understand, Jesus simply said this, If I gain the whole world but lose my soul, I have gained nothing. And that's our message to the people that are successful in doing good. Please keep doing good. We need you to do good. Thank God you're doing good. But is your soul safe in the arms of Jesus? Is your soul ready for eternal life? As much as we do here, we can't take any of our success from here with us 
except what we did for Jesus and for the gospel's sake. All of that can be taken with us into heaven. Amen? So I'm not saying this to condemn the people that are doing good. I know people that are good people. I know that they help people. I know uh, people give millions of dollars away to help the poor. Listen, that's fantastic. And God is going to bless you. You you can't hear the cry of the poor. The Bible says, blessed are the man that even considers the poor. So God has blessings for those people. But remember this, your soul is the most important of all. Get your soul settled in God. Then all the rest is going to be a, a, a beautiful life. Amen? Amen. So look at this. See, I'm not downing any of these people. I'm glad they live in my community. But it's going to take a little bit more than that when it comes to your soul. The ascension of Jesus into heaven was God's witness to the world that this is the righteousness that God will accept. And I'm going to say that again. The, the, the resurrection of Christ into heaven itself was God's witness to the world that this is how it's done. You must also resur- be resurrected into heaven like Jesus was. That's the righteousness that he will accept. Amen? Amen. And lastly tonight, I'm going to talk about the we, the Holy Spirit came to convince the world of judgment, of judgment. Now, what what is the convincing that the Holy Spirit is going to do through us? It's going to convince people that there actually is a judgment day, the certainty of judgment day. Because the ruler, and Jesus put it this way, he says, because the ruler of this world has already been judged. So there's going, so he's showing you by the example that Satan was judged already when Christ defeated him at the cross. Satan has been judged. He cannot get back from that now. It's too late for him. It's, he's gone. It's over. But God is showing us that if you're here in this world and you're alive, it's not over for you yet. You still have a chance to to make it a good judgment day, to stand before God with a good heart and a good spirit before God. So let's talk about that, okay? So the Holy Spirit came to to convince us and the world to convince us of the certainty of Judgment Day. We think of the great white throne judgment, where all the dead, small and great, shall must appear before God. And the Bible says the books were opened, and they were judged out of those things that were written in those books. There are records in heaven kept of your life, and it's recorded what you have done. Whether it's good or bad is going to be in those books. Now, this is where repentance is such a vital part of making heaven your home. You know, Jesus came with that message, repent. In other words, change your mind, turn around, turn to God with all your heart, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, and and I, one scripture that is really powerful in the Bible, it's probably one of the most powerful, is it's found in the New Testament when it says, Judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if the righteous scarcely enter in, where will the sinner and ungodly appear? In other words, the house of God, the church, the church, the preaching in the house, is actually a prejudgment time. It's actually a chance for us to fix things in our life before Judgment Day, it begins at God's house. Amen? So isn't that great? So that's why our pastor so adamantly talks about church attendance. And as much as you can be in church, please be there. Or come online, hear the word, so that you can make good decisions about your soul. Amen? So we can be prejudged before the real Judgment Day. You see, the prince of this world is judged. Satan has been judged. The cross, the cross spelled Satan's defeat. His power 
was ended at the cross. Uh, and I want to say that again. His power over this sin and death ended at the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He defeated Satan once and for all, and he apprehended the keys of death and of hell that were once held by Satan because sin came into the world and he became the prince of the world and the ruler of this world in darkness. However, Jesus defeated him and took back the reins of immortality. <laughs> Hallelujah. The devil has no power over eternal life anymore. He has no power over anything anymore. He has only one weapon, one weapon that has not been taken away from him, and that is deception. Deception. He tempts man and tries to deceive you to do bad things. If he can tempt you with his deception and cause you to sin, then he's winning you. You see how it works? But other than that, he can't touch you. He can't, especially a born-again Christian. He has A born-again Christian has the power of the Holy Spirit in him. He can't go past that. But what does he do? He lures. He tries to lure you away from God, away from church, away from the Holy Spirit, away from your brethren, and tries to get you isolated and starts to talk to you and tries to deceive us. You see, that's how he does it. You know, in Revelation, it said there were seven heads upon the dragon. And those seven heads were all wounded except one. One head was healed. And I believe that head that was healed was deception. You see, God had seven spirits and Satan tried to defeat the seven spirits of God. So he had to put seven crowns upon his head to try to defeat. In other words, to defeat the spirit of love, he has hatred. To defeat the spirit of truth, he has a lie. To defeat the, to defeat the spirit of life, he has death. You see, Satan has counterfeit opposites of everything God has. But listen, the only thing he has left now, he, he was wounded. His heads, his crowns were taken off his head except one. He was healed. One head was healed. Deception. That's his tool. That's, that's his greatest asset. He's a liar and the father of lies. Amen? Amen. But Jesus is the truth. And Jesus will never lie to us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. You see, Satan was defeated at the cross. Listen to me. You no longer need to be bound by sin anymore. It has no more authority over you. Amen. It's been defeated at the cross. Now, I want to read a scripture to you that is so great. It's in Colossians 2.14. Colossians 2.14. I'm going to close with this. It says this. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Blotting means he erased Jesus erased the record of ordinances, the law that was against us because of all the sins we had done, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way. He took that book, that, that, that parchment of uh, handwriting, parchment of all the things that we had done, the bad things of sin, and he took it out of the way and he nailed it. Oh, glory to God, Jesus. He nailed it to the cross. <laughs> Hallelujah. He nailed the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. He nailed it to that cross and he covered it with his blood. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, my God, my God. Hallelujah, Jesus. And listen to this. And having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, he showed the whole world 
that he had defeated Satan and he won the victory when he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Satan is defeated forever. He's lost. The battle is over. It is finished. I can hear a pastor singing her favorite song. It is finished. The battle is over. Jesus has won. Christ disarmed Satan and his principalities and powers that had power over men. He disarmed them. They have no more weapons except one, deception. That's all he has left. Don't let him lie to you anymore tonight. Don't let him use his powers of deception on you. Hallelujah. The devil is a liar and he's the father of lies. Resist him and he will flee from you tonight. Resist him and he will flee from you tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Oh, let's just praise him for a minute. I feel the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is so good. Amen. Listen to this. He canceled the certificate of debt that we owed. There were the debt of legal demands, which were in force until the cross. You have to understand the law was in force until the cross. Once Jesus died on that cross, he erased the debt of the demands of the law against us that were hostile to us. He dismissed them. He erased them. And this certificate, he set it aside and completely removed it by nailing it to the cross. Do you know where that, do you know where your past is right now? It is buried. It is buried in the sea of forgetfulness. Hallelujah. Never to be brought up against you again. Amen. Oh, God is so good, isn't he? I just, I feel the presence of God too, Sister Donna. I feel the truth of God's word going out tonight. And, and you just remember this, that you are the agent of the Holy Spirit. The agent. Now, I, I want you to do something. I want you to look at your life tonight and look at the areas that you may need some help in, okay? We're still human. We still have some character issues we may have to deal with. But let's, let's believe in the Holy Spirit to help us overcome those areas and become better and greater Christians. Amen? Can we do that tonight? So let's believe. And at this point, at this point, I want you to put your uh, needs of prayer here uh, briefly. And um, w remember Brother Andy's brother um, that has come down with COVID. And if there's anybody else and the people watching in your family that may have come down with it, we're going to pray right now. All right. Let's all pray together and let's believe and, and let's send out the Holy Spirit to these people. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, I just thank you. I thank you for what you did at that cross. I thank you for removing the sins of the world there and nailing it there for and, and, and covered it with your blood forever, never to be brought up against us again. Lord, I ask you to touch your people tonight that are hearing, those that are listening tonight over Facebook, in their need, Lord, help them to overcome. If it's something in their character, help them to work on it and overcome it in your righteousness in your godliness. Lord, help us, God, to overcome our flaws and our failures. Help us to be confident in you and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, when we go out and we meet people out on the street, in our jobs, wherever we may go, give us a word in due season, Lord. Give us a, a refreshing word that's going to cause people to, to want to be saved, to want to come to church. Lord, give us that power. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of his message, the Bible says they were pricked in their heart, which means they were convinced. They were convicted. And they said, what shall we do? And, she, and Peter said, repent and be baptized. What a message. What a great example of the conviction of the Holy Ghost. Help us, O Lord, today we pray. In your mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And if I don't see you, uh, have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas with uh, your families and, and friends. And uh, hopefully we'll see you between now and then in church, maybe. But uh, let's believe God for all these needs tonight. Praise God. Isn't God good? 
And uh, let's just thank him for all the good things that he's doing in our lives. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful night.